everyone, I'm Lucy and welcome back to my channel and today I am joined by the wonderful Sarah J Mars. Hi! I am so excited to be filming a Q&A with her today. So the first half of the questions are going to be Akatar related, I hope right. you don't mind. Right. But okay, so the first question for me really was why did you choose to um, kind of retell Beauty and the Beast for this story? I've been a fairy tale addict since I was like little tiny kid. I was like the weird like changeling in the house <laughs> where like my parents are big readers but they're very like intellectual readers and like I was like the little like demon that was yeah. like I want magic and unicorns <laughs> and fairies and so my parents were like all right like as long as you're reading like we're, we're cool with that yeah. so um, they got me like every like fairy tale fantasy type story they could get their hands on uh, when I was a kid and Beauty and the Beast is one of my like favorite fairy tales Mine too. of all time, and yeah. I always wanted to do um, like a Beauty and the Beast retelling. And when I got the idea for Akatar, um, I basically was like, I had this image of what eventually became the first chapter in the book, where mm. this young huntress was stalking through a snowy wood, um, knowing that if she didn't bring food home for her family, like they would probably starve. Yeah. And I, and once I had that like little like idea for you know that one scene, um, which is basically like as I wrote it, like that's first like chapter one is that scene like yeah. as it came out of me like very like oh, wow. lightly edited it's really weird actually because yeah. um, usually my stuff gets like ripped apart yeah um but once i had that idea for the scene i asked myself all right why was her family so poor um and i knew that in the original beauty and the beast legend um beauty's family used to be a merchant class family who yeah. fell into poverty and i thought like ooh, like this could be my one shot of <laughs> doing a beauty <laughs> Beast retelling, <laughs> and I thought since I'm like doing a Beauty and the Beast retelling, why not like bring in some of my other favorite fairy tales and folklore, like yeah. East of the Sun, West of the Moon, which mm -hmm. is a Norwegian folk tale, um, and then Tamlin, which is an English legend, and so I kind of blended them all together, um, and in doing the retelling, they kind of provided the overall structure and like backbone of the book. Yeah. Um, but then by the time I actually wrote it, it became its like own original fantasy yeah. novel with like nods to those fairy tales. So it's kind of a retelling, like kind of like an original fantasy story. Mm. I don't know, like like a retelling light. It I don't is. know. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean like because there are nods to like, you know, the fairy tales yeah. here and there. And I think Feyre, my heroine, is like she's a beast figure mm. as well. Um, and she actually goes through more of a transformation, I think, in the end than yeah. Tamlin, you know, the shape-shifting yeah. exactly. beast figure. What I really loved about Akatar was how you kind of set up this Beauty and the Beast kind of arc, so with Tamlin and Feyre, but then the ending kind of hints to another form of mm. Beauty and the Beast as mm. well, with uh, Rysand or Reese. Reese, yeah. Um, I absolutely adore him, so what was kind of, how was it constructing his character? What um, made you bring him in? <laughs> My bracelets are like clacking, <laughs> so I'm gonna take them off. Um, <laughs> so, Reese was a character that I didn't even like plan on him coming into the series until I got to that fire night scene. Yeah. And then like he like literally just like scrolled like <laughs> onto like the field and I was like, well shit. Sorry. <laughs> like, I know we're gonna fire. fire. <laughs> I was like, well shit. Like yeah. here here's this guy and it's like so hard to talk about Reese because a lot of his like Secrets will come out in Oh my god, two. I can't wait! Um, Sorry. Yeah, if you're a Reese fan, <laughs> you'll definitely enjoy Reese fan. Um, You'll enjoy book two. Yeah. That bargain that he made with Feyre, that, yeah. that comes into, that comes into in. play. Um, and it's kind of Hades and Persephone style bargain yeah. with them. Um, but Reese, oh man, I love it. I'm like, I'm like <laughs> I need, I'm a, dr I need a drink of my tea. I just, to calm the nerves. Oh my god. Actually, now you mentioned Hades and Persephone, there are, there are so many theories swimming around like the internet just about kind of Reese and Feyre and how that relates to the Hades and Persephone myth. I've also been stalking your Pinterest, which I'm sure a lot of the people who watch these videos will as well. And yeah, you kind of leave a lot of kind of hints oh and my references. God. Okay. First of all, <laughs> Pinterest is my addiction. Um, I am on that site way more than I should be. I get like anxiety when I'm like really? not on Pinterest. I'm like, am I missing good <laughs> pins right now? Um, it's really bad. Um, no judgment. But yeah, I feel like if you're like creeping on my Pinterest board, like there are lots we of know. like hints. Yeah. Um, like there are like mentions of like new characters um, in yeah. book two. Um, you, okay, I feel like since it's on my Pinterest board, I mm. can say like Feyre goes to the night court in book two and meets yes. some new characters. I can't um, wait. That like 
There are some new, like, really cool female characters that I'm super excited yeah. about, but, like, the ones I've been pinning are, like, the dudes um, yeah. that you meet. <laughs> of um, course. Cassian and Azrael, who I am, like, really into. Yeah. Um, it, like, this was, like, the book of, like, shirtless warrior <laughs> men. <laughs> we'll see, like, I'm still editing books yeah. right now, so we'll see, like, how much how many shirtless men are in there. <laughs> You've got to keep it above four. Like, I that's know. the natural count of it. I know. It's just, <laughs> I have an addiction to Pinterest and shirtless, sweaty, muscular men. Who doesn't? That's why Who we doesn't? read your books, Sarah. No, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Not just like, that reason. It's for the heroines and the plot, <laughs> and but mostly the men. females. Let's exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, what does a typical writing day look for? You, look like for you? Um, it kind of. I have like a weird morning ritual mm -hmm. where I like eat the same thing <laughs> every morning um, without fail. It's kind of like my way of getting like my mind and body. Ready. Ready to write. <laughs> um, so I will like wake up and like just go through like the emails like on my phone. Just like like lying like a dirt grub in bed. I'll, and yeah. I'll just be like 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 without like my contacts in. I'll be like like have the phone like here. I'll be like what? what's going on. <laughs> I don't even process like what I'm reading, but it's like knowing like yeah. What's I'm exactly the same. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll be like I'm not gonna answer any of these right now. I'm no. gonna go eat breakfast instead. So I go downstairs and I eat the same breakfast every day, <laughs> which sounds like. A cereal <laughs> but Good I, pun. I have a cup of English breakfast tea with milk Good. Um, and while that's brewing I will have three three <laughs> pieces of turkey bacon washed down by a glass of fresh squeezed and only fresh squeezed <laughs> juice and then like all of that washed down by a glass of ice water um, and like it's the weirdest breakfast like I don't even know like how I <laughs> got onto that yeah. path. Like, I wasn't like, oh, you know, like, this is like a healthy Hel breakfast. Yeah. I just was like, I need, like, the... Sustenance. Yeah, I just need, I need the protein yeah. of the turkey bacon and, like, the salt. Like, mm. I love savory foods, but then I also need, like, the sweetness and citrus, like, zang of yeah. the orange juice. And then I need, like, the mellow, like, richness of the, the tea. tea. So it's like, like, the a recipe of your, type. of your writing. Yeah. yeah. So, like, once I get through, like, all of that, um, I'll make myself a second cup of tea and go upstairs and, like, mm. finally answer all the emails that I was, yeah. like, ugh, I gotta let me answer this now. <laughs> um, and then, like, that'll usually, like, take me until, like, lunchtime when I'll be like, oh, it's time to eat, like, a giant meal. Yeah. Um, so I'll eat lunch and then by that point it's like 12 or 1 o'clock and mm. then I'll just like write for the rest of the day. Oh, um, okay. And then like I'll write until dinner time and if yeah. my husband like, my husband will come home for dinner and sometimes I'll be like, oh like let's be social and like sometimes I'll be like, I can't even speak to you, get out of my office. Yeah. Um, and be a total weirdo and like lock myself like Gollum in a cave. Yeah. Just being like I'm gonna like write all night. Um, but I usually like stick to the same kind of schedule where it's like mm. mornings are for like eating my weird ritual Breakfast food booth, yeah. and answering emails <laughs> and then like the afternoons are for like being like a total like weirdo writer like blasting music and crying over yeah. my stories um but that's kind of like my daily like process um but like writing every book is like different you know just like with, when it comes to actually like writing the book and like what I yeah. go through um like some books I just like write to like a non-stop musical playlist and exactly. other books um sometimes I'll just have silence for mm. like weird lengths of time like what I'm writing the fifth thorn of glass book right now um and like I've had a lot of like si like I need silence yeah scenes where like it's very bizarre oh, every, wow. like it's like usually o like I can only write to music but yeah with some of these scenes like I've needed like oh no I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing I don't know either I'm like what's wrong like it's like my yeah. like, my con like my muse like broken but no, we'll, sure, we'll, see, we'll see like what this book winds up being. Like I'm having a lot of fun writing it. Yeah. So usually that's a good sign. Definitely. So in terms of Throne of Glass, mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge Kale and Selena <laughs> shipper. Which, you know, the way things are heading probably isn't a good thing. But yeah, is there any hope for Kale fans? I can't say anything. Oh to no. You <laughs> or to, to you. Or to you. Um <laughs> I I mean I think things like things get like sorted out with, okay like, the queen of shadows and yeah they do like see each other there's a sampler online right now the yeah. first three chapters and um selena or aelin as i should yeah, call her yeah, now she yeah. she sees kale um and they do have their reunion um i think a couple chapters mm. after that um but i'm not like saying anything about oh, ships wow. and like romantic wait. pairings but yeah. um like i have it all like planned like selena has chosen um, at this point, yeah. so. Oh god, that makes me so nervous, like, <laughs> wow. It's like okay. I have all these secrets I know. Of me, and I'm like, oh, I want to tell you everything, but. 
Aww. I can't. You'll have to wait until September oh, 1st. Oh, God. <laughs> it'll be too far away. It'll be fine. So, um, Manon was another character that you introduced in Era Fire. Mm -hmm. So, where is her kind of story arc heading? And also, what kind of made you bring in this character who you're kind of rooting for in a weird way, even though she's so kind of complex and nasty in a way? Um, Manon was basically... She was kind of like Reese in Akatar, where she just <laughs> walked onto the page. Yeah. Um, and I'd had her in the back of my mind for years, and I knew what I wanted to do with her in the later books, and mm. like what role she would play. Um, but when I was writing Air of Fire, um, Selena slash Aelin's story, and that was so like dark and heavy and sad, mm. um, and I like out of the blue just like heard Manon's like first scene where she like rips those yeah. guys' throats out. Um, it just like played out in my mind and I wound up writing it and it became this really nice like counterbalance mm. to like, you know, like Selena's going through this massive journey in Air yeah. of Fire um, and her feelings are very much a part of that and then Manon's is kind of, they like have like mirror journeys I think, mm -hmm. but like Manon is a character who does not care if mm -hmm. someone likes her and like with Manon I kind of had this freedom where I didn't particularly care if the reader liked Manon. Like yeah. she, Manon was this bloodthirsty killer who like goes through her own emotional arc of like mm. learning about feelings. Yeah, I'm gonna say, but, yeah. And like that wound up like like Manon's journey in that book wound up like stealing my heart to the point where like my editor when she got the first draft mm. of Air of Fire was like this book is really, really long and you could make it way less shorter by cutting Manon from the book. Oh, and wow. I said, yeah. no, she has to be She's in the book. Part of the book um, like made. she has to start her journey here at this point in order for like what goes on later, later to actually you know have an impact on the reader and that was when my camera annoyingly stopped filming so i thought i would do my own ending just to kind of let you guys know where the conversation went from there basically with the wonderful sarah i had the best time and want to thank bloomsbury for giving me the opportunity but also for sarah for making me feel so comfortable and welcomed and she was just a dream to talk to because she was so funny and made you just feel like you were among friends which was brilliant. So I did actually get a chance to ask her some of your fan questions but that was annoyingly the footage that went missing so I thought I would kind of go over what she said to your guys' questions because you guys did kindly submit them and I thought it would be best to just kind of let you guys know what she answered. So Lizzie from Those Brill Books kindly asked how Sarah managed to kind of fit so much into one novel without it being kind of too long and there was so much crammed into A Court of Thorns and Roses but in a really good way. And Sarah said that she usually writes those kind of really long books and her first edit is literally kind of a really 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 long book and usually her editors tell her to kind of cut bits out or you know re-edit the ending or something like that but for A Court of Thorns and Roses Literally, I think she said that she wrote it that long just because she felt like the story ended then and I know that she has lots planned for the sequel of Court and Thorns and Roses which at present we don't know a lot about but I'm so so excited for it. And then Esther from A Reading Addiction asked how does Sarah deal with her inner critic and yeah just kind of knowing when to turn off the critical brain and to this I thought it was really interesting because Sarah kind of said that she allows herself, especially in the first draft, to suck. And Sarah herself said that her first drafts are usually absolute messes and just allows herself to have that switch off from perfection. And I found this a really great piece of advice because as someone who is trying to write and to all those budding writers out there, it's so hard to turn off that part of your brain whilst writing that really kind of edits it already and you don't want to put anything down on your word document or on paper that isn't perfect and I think from somebody who has written so many best-selling novels like Sarah J Maas it's really great to hear that that her first draft isn't what kind of ends up in the finished product and that she allows herself to just get it down on paper which I think is a great piece of advice so thank you Esther for asking that question and then the final question I got time to ask was from Miss Lily03 on YouTube and she asked what fairy tales will Sarah retell next or what fairy tales would she like to retell next and to this she kind of touched on the next book of A Court of Thorns and Roses which we haven't got a title for yet but it is coming out next year, next spring I think she said and she basically said or hinted that she was going to be retelling the Hades and Persephone myth and literally I just 
exploded because that's so exciting but also I love how there's kind of a theme of fairy tale retelling throughout this entire series I think she said at one interview at some point that each book in the series will be a retelling of some sort and she talks about how she retold not only Beauty and the Beast in A Court of Thorns and Roses but also a Norwegian fairy tale and also an English folk tale called Tamlin and I think this was great because it wasn't just one kind of dimension of retelling of fairy tales. It was kind of layers upon layers and I think that's what makes A Court of Thorns and Roses such a great book. So thank you for asking that question and I hope that kind of explained things a bit to you and I'm sorry I lost that footage, it was very frustrating. I also just want to say thank you as a whole. From the moment that I posted my announcement video telling you guys that I would be sitting down with Sarah, you guys have just gave me the nicest comments and just being really supportive and thank you for that because it really gave me the confidence to go in there and just film with Sarah knowing that you guys would like to see this and that's great so thank you and thank you to you guys for watching and I'll see you next time guys bye